Uh, first up is going to be Nicole Jarina from Puerto Rico. Hi, Coach. I hope you are doing well. How much means for the team the way Booker is handled the ball and controlled the game without Chris to protect the home court? But, you know, without Chris, it was it was huge for us, especially in, in game one, after having about a week off. Um, we needed all the points and assist and the force that he played with. I thought it settled us a bit. And, and as the game progressed, we got stronger. Um, we certainly um, needed, when you don't have Chris out there on the floor managing the game. And like I said the other day, Booker, Kevin did a good job of managing uh, the game, closing out quarters and that kind of thing. So we, we needed every point, every rebound, every assist. Um, it's not something we take for granted. Next up is going to be Dave McMiniman with ESPN, followed by Kellen Olson. Uh, we'll set Dave for it. I'm in Dave. Oh, okay. I, I don't think we talked to you in depth uh, after the game about the way you thought campaign played uh, the other night. I, you know, I, he got that tech late, and I knew you kind of threw your head back a little bit. But generally speaking, I know he's not Chris Paul, but were you pleased with the minutes he gave and yeah. you know, kind of the way he managed the game when he was in there? Yeah, I thought when he came back in in his second stint, he had settled down a little bit. Um, and we've, we've had conversations about him being him. Don't worry about being Chris. Like, we like what Cam brings to the table. Nobody can replace what Chris brings. But I thought as the game progressed, he, he, he settled in, he took over the team. He didn't, you know, defer to anyone. He started running the squad. Um, and we're going to need that and more tonight. Next up is going to be Kellen Olsen with Arizona Sports, followed by Cameron Buford. Hey, buddy. Uh, with Cam Johnson and Mikel specifically, Looking at them in point five, they, they played really well in game one with that. How did you see them just evolve in that over the two years? And how grateful are you for like series like this? Did you have those two years with them to get that kind of system embedded? Yeah, I think that that's who they are, though. They they they're not guys that are gonna get the ball and get into their mix and then try to beat you against the set defense. They they tend to be guys that play in more go catch uh, type actions and, and it does help having the continuity um, two years probably isn't enough but they've <laughs> they've just gotten better they're they're everyday guys they, they're the guys we have to kind of kick out of the gym and um you know like i said we're going to need that and more tonight especially without chris next up is cameron buford with the la news observer followed by dan Wojcicki. good afternoon monty how are you doing Hey, uh, would you talk about your relationship with Nate McMillan and how that's developed and what you've been able to pick up from him that helped you become a better coach? I mean, Nate's, he's, a, he's my big brother. Um, he has been since I coached under him in Portland uh, back in 05. Um, I mean, I don't know how much more you can say. You know, he's, he's somebody that I look up to, I rely on for wisdom. Um, we talk a ton. Our families have always been there for each other. Um, I hired Pastor Mel, his son, to come work with us in New Orleans, um, partially because Jamel's smarter than both Nate and myself. And, and two, you know, I, I just felt indebted to Nate for what he did for my career, uh, the five years I spent in Portland. Um, shaped the way I view basketball in so many ways. And it was, it was top. He was the one who forced me, really pushed me to go work for Nate because of the respect you have for him. So um, I'm, I'm elated about his success. Uh, at the same time, I was you know, also sad about Doc, you know, not being able to go forward. That was a tough series to watch, but really happy for Nate. He's, he's just a wise, uh, I call him a plotter because he just plods along every single day, working his tail off. And I always hear these people talk about the hardest working coaches in the league, and his name never comes up. And I've seen it for myself. He never takes a day off. It's amazing to see his work ethic. Thank you, Coach. Next up is Dan Wojcicki with the LA Times, followed by Sam Amick. 
Hey, Bonnie. Um, with, with Chris's sort of status, are, are you confident that once you hear that you can just reinsert him? I know during the regular season, you would maybe be a little more patient when a guy hasn't had court time in yeah. two weeks. Is it sort of the general plan that when he's out, he's back? Is that, is that kind of <laughs> We don't have the luxury of waiting on anybody right now. These games are so important. Uh, every practice, every film session, uh, we certainly will see where he's at but when that time comes. But that, that's hard to make that judgment just because COVID is so different. Um, you got COVID in the playoffs. You know what I mean? It's not COVID in the regular season. So it's hard to. But I'm sure if I try to keep Chris out of the game, he, he's going to square off and <laughs> go toe to toe. So. We just make that assessment when the time comes. But he he's engaged, right? Like I said, I, we talk every day um, about the team, about different ideas. We're watching playoff games. Um, we'll bring up his book. Did you see that? No, nope, but I'm sure you did. So <laughs> you tell me. Um, he just has an unreal mind for the game. Next up is Sam Amick with The Athletic, followed by Gina Mizell. Uh, um, on that same relationship plan, you've always had close connections with the players. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the players that have to And the conversation around the team in the way to how that team can be treated. So I just want to wonder how much of that has your attention. Is Sad. Yeah. It is. It really is. Uh, I, I've been watching it and I'm just blown away that one player is getting that much flack. Um, I spent a lot of time with Ben and care a lot about him. And, um, you know, he, I watched him every day work on his game. I know how much he cares. And so to see this many people attacking him, I know his intention. None of, you, none of us are perfect in this. You know what I'm saying? And so when you watch this, it, it's, it's just sad to watch. I'm close to his brother, Liam, who's in Colorado um, coaching. And so I, I, I hope that Ben uses all of this as fuel to come back and and shot up, set a lot of people up because you know what we do is hard, and, and we we get a lot of criticism, and, and everybody understands that. But what's happening right now is totally unfair. And sad. <laughs> nah, just, that, that's the last thing we need is another stupid like me calling him to try to cheer him up. He's a tough dude. I've seen him. I've been around him. Um, the last thing you need in a moment like that is everybody going after you the way that this has happened. I'm just I've been watching it myself. I'm like you guys. I just think it's kind of sad. Next up is Gina Mizell with Suns.com, followed by Law Murray. Hey, Mark, yeah. the book is talking about, about the offseason and the game going down to the time simulate what the playoffs would be like. It seemed hard to do, and so you actually do it. But did, did you guys have conversations about maybe that in any way as far as, hey, this is what it's going to feel like. Maybe try to stimulate that in some way. Yeah, I just might love to this. Yeah. But yeah, did you guys talk about what that could be like to help them prepare as much as you can before you're actually in it? I think the teams that we've had to play against, and because of the way our team was constructed, put him in a lot of situations. That he's dealing with now. Um, and it really helped us, especially the last month of the season. The crazy road trips we had and the high level teams that we played against. Uh, he's seen all kinds of defenses. And um, when he and I talk, I try not to crowd his mind with too much stuff. I'll give him a reminder about what could be coming next. Uh, but great players, you know, I, I don't know how you do that in the offseason, but great players do it. I mean, if you look at these documentaries of great players, that's what they do. They try to find an edge or paint a scenario, and they live in that world. I wasn't that good, so I have to, like, you know, get my cards out and write up stuff. You know what I mean? Like, that's that's the, that's the extent of what I can do. He's just a really good player, and um, what he's doing is something that um, comes from a lot of work. And I know he wants more, and I, I, he'd be the first one to tell you. Like, we won one game, we got to do more to win two. And uh, I'm sure that's his mindset. We have time for a few more. Next up is going to be Law Murray with the, with the Athletic, followed by Dwayne Rankin. Hey, Mark. I'm 
I've, I've heard you say before that the stability of, of the roster, like everybody for the most part coming in from the beginning of the season and being able to continue throughout the year and really kind of being this year. Dan was not to really praise and Corey Craig for how well they kind of helped the commit on the bench. Corey is a guy who wasn't with the team at the So what was that process for you of developing, you know, not, not just the whole team, but especially with guys who the bench, Corey coming in and getting them ready to contribute when you're relatively important? Yeah, I mean, I, just, I think a lot of credit goes to you know, the coaches to spend so much time with them away from the floor after practice, trying to get them acclimated. You know, everybody has an onboarding system. Every team does. So when you bring a guy like Tori on, there's so many hours after practice, uh, pre-practice, to try to get a guy up to speed. I guess my part is to try not to get in their way, to let them flow uh, in their gift. Um, but the continuity certainly helps because when you have guys that have been in the program for a couple of years, they help also. They, they bring the guys like Tori along and show them like what we're trying to do or explain something stupid that I just said and make them understand it a little bit better than I do. So it's, it's, it's not an easy process, but without your staff working a ton of extra hours, it, it, it doesn't work. And, uh, all of our system coaches, especially Ricardo Flaw, when he comes back, all hours of the night and spend time with the guys, getting up shots, watching film. That, that stuff certainly helps. We got time for three more. Next is going to be Dwayne Rankin with the Arizona Republic and then Gerald Breguet. Coaching back. I want to ask about the rotation that you went with game one. You come on getting minutes. How'd you like that? Just that look overall the way that comes back. Uh, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, anything that I thought was great, but it wasn't bad. It was like what I expected after having a week off, um, you know, without having Chris, a lot of it is just the feel, you know, for what the Clippers are doing and what we think we can do. So we'll, we'll just kind of try to feel it as we go along. It's hard to have a set rotation when you lose Chris and you get into foul trouble or whatever the case may be. So we'll just, Try to feel our way as we go along. Final two questions are going to be Gerald Breguet with Fan Sided and Andrew Greif. Hey, Coach, a uh, related question with those backup guard minutes with Chris out. You've praised guys like Etwan and Langston for being ready all season long, even when their minutes have been up and down. What do you think of the job that Etwan did coming in, especially on this stage after not having played in a while? I just think he's a solid player. Um, he's got a lot of experience and he, he thinks the game, you know, rarely is each one not in the right spot. Um, and he's a guy that can play both positions. He knows how to facilitate the offense. Not afraid to take big shots. So I, it was a an easier decision just because of his ability to keep his head right, which is who he is. And then the last game of the season against San Antonio, we got a chance to see what he can do even when he hadn't played in a while. So I think, you know, as we progress, it'll be even better. On a question is going to be Andrew Greif with the LA Times. Whatever it is that allowed them to do that, um, if that's something you talk to your guys about, or how do you talk to your guys about caring for that? Expecting to see him yeah. you know, great uh, when they get into this position. You have a tense that like any other action that they run or play. But no, I just think it's, we've talked about it, but if I had to point to anything, it's how you know, he doesn't get enough credit for what he's done as a coach. He's won a championship. Look at the things that he has overcome as a coach, deficits you know, down 0 2, down 3 1, like all that stuff is experience that I don't have. And you look at you know, the coaches around the league that get lauded for their ability to coach, you never hear his name. He's one of the best coaches in the league. And so I think his team relies on that that toughness, and that's how he plays. So I think it it goes right to Ty. You know, you never see him get rattled in those situations. And I think their team feeds off of that. So we've talked about that a lot. 
Thank you for your time, Coach. Thanks, Thanks,